Hello, Ivy here. This week's podcast is entitled Is it the post that is wanted or the privilege and protection that comes with it? Who would be king? Episode 133 An introduction This week's podcast is a little different to my usual content but stay with me and all will become clear. As most of you know, I have zero interest in the day-to-day fake news and battles between people who I have less than zero interest in what they do day-to-day. Drama is created to keep in the tabloid headlines, along with all the other fake emotional fallout between people that most of the population of the UK do not give a moment's thought to in any week let alone on a daily basis. Most of the population can name between one to possibly three people in the royal family on a good day. But beyond that, most do not know or care who they are. The creation of the royal rota, despite the official rationale given for the development of this offshoot of the monarchy family, was there to form links with the royals in the palaces and agree the key items of information that the tabloids would print and the unified perspective that the royal family wished to be published about any specific topic. If you look closely at the key daily articles relating to the UK royals, you will spot the same words and phrases scattered through each newspaper content. These briefings are regular and the bias in the news coverage is obvious once you know what to look for and why it has been spun a particular way. The Royal Rota is the propaganda team for the UK Royal Family and in return the Royal Rota are given priority scoops and photo opportunities above anyone else and earn extra money by giving interviews to international news networks about the UK royals. A symbiotic arrangement that has been very cosy up until recent years. As a general rule, I cared less about their private arrangements because I cared even less about the members of the family. I had no interest who they were partnered with, where they lived and family members they produced. The cut ribbons and handshake brigade, even with a Royal Rota team on hand, caused no ripple in my life. All that changed when Lady Diana Spencer came onto the scene. He was someone who genuinely wanted to make a difference and definitely wanted to pursue and support causes that went beyond a smile and a wave on engagements. For the first time, I had one person that created, that caught my interest, I should say, and whose values were so very different to anything we witnessed previously. The bees around the honeypot situations erupted very quickly, and in no time the hunter and prey style of reporting came onto the scene in the UK. Ultimately, it led to fragile egos within the royal family, particularly Princess Diana, following marriage to Prince Charles, popularity overtaking the popularity of her husband, the next in line for the throne. When Princess Diana died in August 1997, in a car accident in the middle of a French tunnel, the UK population went into weeks of mourning something the British royal family had never witnessed before. Even in death, this beautiful lady still outshone the figurehead family of the UK. By this point, Diana was divorced from Charles, and she still outshone him in every way, and all of the monarchy family. Death did not dim Diana's light. The UK public adored her, and she will always be known as the people's princess. No matter what games were played by the establishment 
to wipe the fevered brows of royal males, particularly Prince Charles. To this day, the people's princess continues to outshine King Charles, and he and the rest of the British royal family will continue to be outshone by people who have genuine empathy and skill sets to highlight causes usually ignored by others who want to help in a tangible way and to ensure that the charities concerned benefit in meaningful ways. The crucial element here is that one person in that family was able to connect with a wide range of people and organisations and her empathetic nature drew people towards her. It was no surprise that she was unable to continue her work, but despite best efforts to dim her light, if you know, you know, death did not dim Diana's light. It became one of the brightest stars instead. Prince Charles waited and waited for his chance to be king one day and his eldest son, Prince William, claimed he too was eager to be king one day. In fact, he often spoke in ways that would almost give the impression that William considered himself to be king in all but name only. Then it appears Prince William's world got turned upside down and none of the establishment are admitting the real reason for this major shift in the UK royal operations. The unseen tectonic type shift occurring in the UK royal family. The last eight years has opened up a secret window into Prince William's ambitions. Everything else prior to those eight years was William doing what was expected of him, not least because in royal life he was a little late on beginning that particular aspect of his life. The second in line of succession needed to marry and produce heirs. Love was never a requirement and the royal rotor was there to make it. Seem like romance of the century. I was one of the few who had no interest in the romances he pursued along the way, or cared whether or not they were romances. I knew William would look after would be looked after because all those high up in the chain of command are always looked after from cradle to grave. In many ways that approach to the way staff and courtiers acted around these seniors just created the difficult and entitled adults they became later in life, through no fault of their own. The hereditary system creates damaged individuals who compete against their siblings for relevance and affection, and the firstborn then goes on to become king or queen, and who then have a serious impact upon the quality and type of life that we, the ordinary public, can live. Prince William was now on the cusp of moving into a role that he was destined for and very much wanted. My own observations and thoughts are as follows, and I do not claim that they are factual, but they are my conclusions having watched his behaviour change from married man with a family who loved taking holidays, and though on paper he had two jobs, the impression I had was that he was officially barely attended either in terms of the hours required for each. Prince William appeared to cover way less engagements than expected, but he wasn't occupied in either of his part-time positions, which could offset his lack of availability for any type of royal engagement. The rotor hinted, hinted at his lack of work ethic sometimes, but on the whole, it was ignored, because he would be king one day. A position he always claimed he wanted, and was looking forward to stepping into the role. 
Everything seemed to change in 2016, when Prince Harry informed his family that he had found the one, i.e. Meghan. From that moment, Prince William's focus was on bringing this relationship to a fast ending. The games and trickery are documented, and as time has gone on, the role of the palaces and courtiers and private investigators have come to light and evidence gathered, including William accepting a very large amount of money from a Rupert Murdoch publication. Documented in royal accounts now, but initially came to light in court proceedings in one of Prince Harry's court cases. Until that point, it was not known to Prince Harry or his legal team. That is one of the silver linings of taking out all of these legal cases, because regardless of the outcome, every one of these cases and the content of discussions and pieces of evidence has been documented and stored for eternity. It is important beyond words to have information like this documented in a legal setting because so many aspects of these court cases would not be out in the public domain and documented as a record of proceedings. The veil of secrecy is removed in these settings and evidence is recorded permanently. Prince Harry's brother was throwing him and Meghan under the bus whilst protecting any information about private matters relating to William to come to light and then be printed in the tabloids. Pretty much the playbook used on the spare since childhood. My views on the period between 2016 to January 2020 was that efforts were made to destroy Meghan and if that failed to break her spirit and she would leave. None of the royals believed that Harry would leave as well. In my opinion, there lies the key reason for what has continued since January 2020 to the present day. And reports by Royal Rota about the sudden rages that William flies into have appeared increasingly in the last four years. My firm belief is that Prince William wanted the role of king, just like he likes titles and badges. It is like dealing with a pampered child. He seems to be lifted by pub publicly acclaimed badges of honour, regardless of whether they have any actual meaning. Hence recent fictitious awards and honours to keep the ego stroked and at the same time have the propaganda crew, i.e. Royal Rota, write sycophantic articles about the said award do everything to reduce the possibility of the man written about by the same rotor crew, who is known for his incandescent rages not to actually fly into one because a few weeks have passed by where he has not been praised for anything. The recent news of this prince being handed a former role of Prince Harry and the articles written and photos taken of him standing next to a helicopter, and the poll that was suddenly published naming him, and his position as some kind of babe magnet, was not even amusing, it was embarrassing. This is the image that the UK monarchy wants to present to the world as to how fortunate they will be to meet this person one day and what a bonus he is, some kind of sex symbol. Wow, isn't the UK lucky to have this family as our figurehead family for the world to admire? Helicopter pilot extraordinaire with James Bond potential. The information that is stated quietly is... I doubt he's allowed to fly alone. I am guessing that he has a trained pilot flying with him at all times, 
but I have no proof of that. It's just been a theory of mine for a while that I don't think he has put in sufficient hours to qualify to fly on his own. But I have said, I don't know that. It's just a feeling I get from the way he conducts his life that we've seen publicly. Over the years, Prince William and Catherine have in theory many charities under their umbrella. And until Meghan and Harry became a married couple, there were projects also running under the Royal Foundation banner. When Harry and Meghan split off their charity work to only include projects and engagements that they were responsible for, things began to slip in terms of William and Catherine. They were visible less than before and only used to pop up for joint events with Harry and Meghan. But that was short-lived. Once January 2020 happened and the announcement of stepping back was declared, ready to happen from March 2020, things changed. Observing William's behaviour and demeanour from that date spoke volumes to me and led me to the conclusion I have formed now and remain steadfast in that conclusion. In essence, William had, has, major panic attacks. It was written all over his face and the anger he felt towards Harry daring to leave royal duties was visible and was eating him up from the inside. Officially, it was declared that the Sussexes were outshining the Cambridges and that is against all royal protocol. Prince Charles, who then became King Charles, was equally angry and in his case, this was like a Princess Diana situation all over again. Charles had ensured that William was a clone of himself and therefore both were fearful of the loss of control of the spare and prepared to force him home in some way. Only him and definitely not Meghan. Prince Charles was thinking of his kingship but William had much, much more to worry about. He was used to Harry picking up the slack. Being the friendly face of the duo, he never for a second thought that Harry would leave and move to another continent. William, in my opinion, started to panic and irrational behaviour increased to a whole new level. Prince Charles was confident he would do all kinds of wonderful things as king. He was confident in himself and how he would operate in the role. Little did we all know, including King Charles, that there was a ticking clock over his reign as monarch. King Charles has cancer. William always assumed Harry would be there to do the lifting and William would, as usual, take the glory. Harry stepping back revealed the unspoken chasm that was Harry, was used to deflect from the shortfall in activity that had existed for many years. William had the rug pulled from under his feet. In my opinion, William had lost his wingman. The de deterioration in Prince William's demeanour is visible and it is getting worse. The first blow for Prince William commenced with the announcement on the 8th of January 2020 by Prince Harry that he and Meghan were stepping back as senior royals. Prince William has, for the last four years, increased the charge for destroying the marriage of his brother and to force Harry home, purely out of selfish reasons, in my opinion. My theory is that William would move into the kingship role 
as long as Harry was alongside him. For all the reasons stated previously. The 28th of December 2023 proved to be the unravelling of William's mental state, in my humble opinion. I am making assumptions based on observations and looking out for the red flags that start to appear in such cases according to research. And then, in the first quarter of 2024, I think Prince William began to seriously question his purpose and whether or not he wanted to be monarch. There is footage of an ambulance and a number of royal vehicles with blacked out windows following the blue lit ambulance rushing out of Sandringham on the 28th of December 2023. No information has been given about what that was all about. Due to the chronic handling of matters relating to Prince William and Princess Catherine and family since the 25th of December, the rumour mill has been in overdrive. Poor photoshopping and even worse AI activity has been the communication methods of choice and has been a massive fail and resulted in no faith in what comes out of Kensington Palace. No one has seen Princess Catherine since her last appearance on Christmas Day 2023 and since then conspiracy theories abound exacerbated by the image manipulation and compounded by AI nonsense. Five months later, no sightings or credible explanation for the absence. I personally do not believe the cancer story in relation to Catherine. My personal opinion is that it is not a coincidence that the two people named as discussing the unborn Archie's skin colour becoming public knowledge leading up to Christmas 2023, alongside Catherine being named or implied or guessed by some people who move in those circles in documents, which also included Prince Andrew, are now experiencing poor health and it has taken a toll on the two senior royals that were named. Line of succession. In the article, there is um, quite a detailed image showing the order of succession and it names the top 15 in the line of succession. I'm not going to read out all of that. There is a slide included um, in the podcast, the video podcast. But I'll just read a few lines from my notes. But as I said, there's far more detail in the article itself. At 73, Charles is the oldest British royal to assume the throne. Next in line is 40-year-old Prince William, his eldest son. William has been made the new Prince of Wales, as his father was for more than 50 years. Next in line of succession is William's eldest son, Prince George, the 10-year-old, is now second in line to the throne. And it goes on to say, here are the first seven members of the royal family depicted in this image. And then underneath that, a list of the top 15. Next heading. Will Charles step down and hand over to William within the next year or two? Prince George is coming up in the ranks and I suspect that his father considered the possibility of George moving into the position as a young king and staying there for many decades. Assuming that Prince George wants to step into that role in his early twenties, that would free up William to return to the aristocratic social life that he enjoys and enjoyed whilst pretending he was spending time with his young family, allegedly. I have no way of knowing that. 
Princess Charlotte shows far more signs of taking that role on and doing a wonderful job. It's early days, we can't really tell that at this stage. I do, however, doubt that the UK monarchy has many decades left as a royal family, so all this conjecture could be a waste of time. The panic, the anger, the inner rage, the inability to control his mood swings and the obvious signs of use of some choice of substance or two to enable him to enter certain spaces and to get through it whilst remaining stoic and keeping a reasonable sense of professionalism. Only the UK royal family have their people come forward and publicly state that someone in the family has not done something with no evidence that anyone in the family had been accused of such an action. An activity that most people would not have noticed or even cared about if they had. But as soon as certain statements are put out into the public domain, in a coordinated way, in every tabloid, using the same key phrases in their fantasy article, the game is immediately given away. One example. Prince William does not drink alcohol excessively. He can only manage a pint. Who will remember the vast number of photos over the decades of the opposite being the case, apparently? Not an issue, until the UK press all write about the same activity on the same day. As someone who takes limited interest in the British royal family and became involved once they started to disrespect Princess Meghan, one observation regarding this fairy tale that the prince only drinks a pint of alcoholic beverage. Perhaps it is unwise to choose a member of the royal family where there are numerous photos and footage of the unofficial royal town crier that clearly show he enjoys a pint or two, may not be the best person to utilise to persuade the public about the one pint scenario relating to his new drinking buddy. There is also the very strange announcement by the Royal Rota earlier this year, within days of the news that Thomas Kingston had been found deceased in a property on his parents' grounds. Someone I had never heard of until that announcement. He is married to Lady Gabriella Windsor. A couple of days later, the Royal Rota scurried out from their holes to write the same key words, all emphasising that Prince William had nothing to do with his death. How very strange. No connection had been made about anyone else being responsible for his death, let alone the next in line to the throne. Now, by this amateur instruction, by royal PR, it had people thinking and asking questions and then went off to find out any possible connection. I believe that King Charles is far from well, but in true fashion, he is working far more days than his eldest son. I think he is getting his house in order. No doubt we will all see over the coming months and years. I don't believe that Catherine is ill with cancer. I see this whole scenario as buying time. I believe that she was in the ambulance that was spotted and recorded on the 28th of December 2023. But I don't think that her or the children are in the UK right now. She is keeping away from UK media. Fight, flight or freeze. Our need to survive has shaped 
how we respond to the environment and the threats we face. Our fight, flight and freeze responses help us to face up to perceived threats, run away or stop moving. The freeze response involves being rendered immobile when confronted with a potential threat. With fight and flight on hold, and a reference here for McCabe and Ms. Milos, sorry, Milosevic in 2015, page 180. For much of our 21st century life, flight and fight responses are becoming less helpful, albeit still common. According to Harvard Heath Publishing, 2020, chronic activation of this survival mechanism is commonplace and damaging to our physical and mental wellness. Science has long known that long-term chronic stress, the repeated activation of the stress response, takes a pro profound toll on psychological and physical health both directly and indirectly, with some of the following results, Harvard Health publishing 2020, Kazan in 2019. It is so much more than just fight or flight. A summary of the scientific background. First, a quick overview of the terminology. The first three are obvious. At times of immense stress, it is common for people to become combative or overly defensive, which is fight, to abruptly remove themselves from the situation, which is flight, or shut down, become withdrawn and unable to make decisions, which is the freeze element. This may manifest as any of the following. The fight trauma response. Temper that is very explosive and unpredictable. Taunts, mocks, insults or shames. My way or the highway tendency to need the final say and ignore others' perspectives. Yells, slams doors, screams, becomes aggressive. Easily becomes reactive, can confuse people with their big emotions. Always feels as though they're being threatened, will protect themselves at any cost. Often feels shameful, remorseful, post-outburst. Talking back to authority figures. The flight trauma response. Chronic rushing or always going. Feels uncomfortable or even panic when still. Energy spent micromanaging people and situations around them. Has a history of abruptly ending relationships or phobic off commitment. Feels trapped easily. Makes plans to avoid any downtime or throws themselves into work achievement. Often presents an ang as anxiety or panic attacks, being intentionally or unintentionally distracted. The freeze trauma response. Feeling completely numb, life is pointless. Shut down, silent treatment, complete avoidance. Hiding out from the world. Procrastination or inability to make even small decisions. Endless social media scrolling, binge TV watching. Confusion over what is real or unreal or actually happening. Often confused, misdiagnosed with depression. Giving up quickly. There is a fourth response, and I have um, put a reference source link for that because that was quite detailed, and that is headed up as fawn. So the fourth response 
is fawn, F-A-W-N, refers to when someone actually moves closer to the source of their trauma and tries to placate or win over their aggressor. As I said, more information in two of the reference sources listed at the end of the article. Let's have a look at my conclusions. Since the passing of the Queen, the remaining members of the royal family continue to behave like a poor version of the Keystone Cops. Yet another embarrassment on the world stage. My thoughts on the current couple lined up to be the next King and Queen consort, William and Catherine, are as follows. Catherine is similar to William in lots of ways. Both like titles and badges, but are not that interested in the substance. Catherine is fine when smiling and waving. And to be fair to Catherine, that is all royals have ever been expected to do. None of them were ever required to manage or oversee projects. None of them were required to be business savvy. None of them were ever required to launch projects or provide progress reports on said projects. In fact, visiting charity organisations were never projects. They were minutes spent at a venue and it was classed as an engagement. No royal was ever meant to be more than a photo opportunity for charity and member of the royal family, in the belief that a visit from a member of the monarchy would generate interest and having the word royal on their logo would ensure a certain type of regard and longevity. William. William shared the concerns of the royal family and in particular the courtiers and the royal rota. Later became public knowledge during one of Harry's legal cases that William was working with the tabloids in particular and had recently received a very large sum of money from Richard Murdoch. That figure is now shown in the public accounts. With everything else he now appears to be stressed over, lying down with tabloid personnel operating in an illegal way is no fun when you have no more information to feed through to them. At some point, they will turn on him. He has a growing list of things that add to his fight, flight or freeze dilemma. Not sure he will reach the fawning stage, which you will be able to read more about in the reference sources below, as I mentioned earlier. Harry and Meghan approached their connection with organisations needing an uplift of any kind in a different way to anyone else in the royal family. The interest in the couple started immediately after it was announced that Harry and Meghan were a couple in 2016. By the time they were married, two years later, the seniors within the royal family started to feel the attention that the couple were receiving was becoming an issue. The Australian and New Zealand tour in the autumn of 2018 was a fabulous tour and set the tone and style of things to come. By the time their plane landed back in the UK, the knives were out. It was also on the final day that Harry announced his intention to take a number of tabloids to court over their illegal activities relating to gather, the, the, the gathering of information, in order to print salacious stories based on information gathered in an illegal way, and which caused much heartache and stress-related issues. The gauntlet was thrown down. It could have been so different. Everyone could bring something to the table. But no, the rule was only those high in the line of succession 
could bring anything, and everyone else was meant to be a sideshow. Charles and William had no interest in doing measurable engagements, other than tick a box that they had attended something. Ah oh well, thoughts and prayers, etc. Harry and Meghan won, because they escaped the plantation behind the gilded gates, and now the rest of the family are floundering whilst trying to pretend everything will be fine. Nothing to see here. Spend most of their time, around 90% in my reckoning, working on ways to destroy Harry and Meghan, rather than spend most of their time on matters of state. That activity commissioned and conducted on another continent is going to ensure the UK royal family receives what it is not expecting. All of it will be self-inflicted. Going back to the title of this podcast, is it the post that is wanted or the privilege and protection that comes with it? Who would be king? Since January 2020, when Harry formally announced that they were stepping back from senior royal duties, Prince William has not been settled in his own skin. The obsession to make his brother return to the fold and the effort put into destroying him gives me vibes that if he, William, cannot live a happy life, then his brother cannot possibly do so either. With each positive feedback or outstanding result achieved in Archwell's various projects, within hours of each announcement, William appears with cameras doing something similar. It is so childish, it is embarrassing, and makes me continue to question the state of his mental health. None of the behaviour in the last four years is edifying for a future king, and despite the royal family ignoring for years what they have created in the form of the next in line, It is blatantly obvious that he possesses no skills to undertake such a role, even within the UK, never mind the global stage. Not even the royalists who are entering their twilight years make the effort to come out in droves when William has an engagement, and use of barriers is an embarrassment on every occasion without the rent a mob crowd from the local nursing homes or staff from the venues being visited. Their lanyards give them away each time, and on one occasion there were only three of them outside in over an acre of ground, excuse me, behind barriers. Staff walk ahead of him, encouraging, begging people to cheer. It is embarrassing and cringeworthy. The royal family itself and its courtiers created this situation and anyone with an ounce of business savvy could have told them that decades ago. Now we have a broken man on our hands and if we force him to go into a role that he is not suited for and does not want without his wingman and a group of sycophants around him to do the actual work required, The monarchy will fold within months, not years. Whatever William's involvement in Catherine's current state of health and the journey undertaken to reach this state of affairs is weighing on him greatly. This makes for high-risk regency life for the UK and in terms of staff or family care, the monarchy family or the firm look very weak right now. Harry is not to blame for the situation the royal family finds itself in. Lack of workforce planning and succession planning is to blame. It was as plain as day that nothing had been done because it was assumed the ribbon cutting and the smiling and waving would suffice 
because people adored the UK royal family enough to keep it going. Big mistake. The true royalists amount to less than a third and the numbers are near a quarter and the age group of that group is 65 and above. Young people don't feature heavily and the under 25s are in single figures. Again, that could be seen occurring and growing significance for decades and as young people came along, monarchy was not something that attracted many new people of any age group. In a modern day society, paying deference to people by their birth journey and family they belong to has drastically fallen out of fashion and people who can read a room realised that fact years ago and made changes. The UK, like so many things, thought they would always have the Minions support them forever. The minions that the royal family look down upon and everything else that is done around charities and people less well off than top tier societal groups has been performative. The monarchy died with the passing of Queen Elizabeth and what is left are the actions of dying flies. There is enough evidence of William experiencing fight, flight or freeze psychological behaviours and the disappearing from view at unexpected times is part of that process. I have not given out details of every aspect but I have put a few reference sources at the end of the accompanying article which will be out on Monday the 27th of May. The evidence is provided by the way the Royal Rotors scurry out of their holes with some form of nonsense wording and then scurry back to hide out of embarrassment. Footage also exists over the months with Prince William looking less than interested or alert and on at least one occasion was concentrating more on staying upright than anything else. This is not fair on anyone, the prince or the people waiting to experience meeting a royal for whatever purpose. The optics are shocking and should not be allowed to continue and then pretending it did not happen. It adds further harm to the UK and its royalty. Being a monarch carries with it many advantages along with many responsibilities. In terms of advantages, no monarch can be charged with illegal activity. No monarch can be charged with a crime. Members of the royal family cannot be questioned or arrested in relation to any crimes if they are within the same building of the monarch. And they definitely cannot be questioned by any law enforcement agency if their target is in the same room as the monarch. I mention that because until the Royal Rota were clearly instructed to wave the metaphorical banner depicting events surrounding a certain death and then go running for the hills, it was like a warning to those enforcement agencies if they had any plans to ask questions of any member of the royal family, they were being reminded it would be a waste of time. And chances are they would not get past the gate to the premises where the monarch was present at that time. Why else would such a claim or statement be made in such a public way about the next in line? The actual public announcement in articles by all of the rotor which appeared in all of the tabloids, was a double-edged sword. It may have been an intended reminder to law enforcement, but it was an own goal in terms of the public, who did not know of any connection, and if they did, cared even less. Now, something is out there which continues to lead to conspiracy theories to abound. In so doing, increasing the pressures and the stress on an individual 
whose wires appear tight right now. Implosion or explosion or both, an increasing risk which could have been avoided. Maybe there are plans for temporary cover of that post. I can imagine that King Charles would like to have quality time with his wife and do things whilst he's able to do so. And at the same time, Prince William is not in a place where he can take on the role and run with it. I am not even sure the next in line wants the role anymore. His house does not appear to give the impression that the next in line is still eager to become king. Not without his footstool anyway. But he may possibly need protection, which can still occur by the things I have just said. However, I am giving no opinion whether I think it is right that family members are protected from the laws of the land that the rest of us have to adhere to. I have very little to say about the missing princess. I hope that she is all right and sorting her life out in such a way that gives her some amount of peace. Making any kind of big comeback will be short-lived because the monarchy is not in a secure position anymore. And any grand entrance will be short-lived because whilst the public will be happy to see the princess again, they will not take kindly to being lied to for months on end. If the situation is worse than that, there will be sadness. But again, the backlash from being lied to for months will weaken the monarchy as a construct even more. I would like to see sensible procedures put in place or the beginning of an inevitable process anyway of the de deconstruction of the monarchy. The signs of implosion are there and the country needs better on many fronts right now and for the foreseeable future. To close this podcast, there are a few reference sources on this occasion because this podcast came from the heart. Words just flowed freely over a few hours and two sittings to type it all out. The reference sources given all relate to the fight, flight or freeze psychological processes and the signs to look out for. Hopefully that will be useful to anyone who is experiencing these types of emotions at the moment. That's it from me for this week. I hope you found it interesting. I look forward to hearing your thoughts on my thoughts on this week's podcast. And I will speak to you Sunday night onwards. It's bye from me. Bye from Ivy. Bye.